not be that spaz guy. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Anyone's like, no, you're wrong. Anything? I don't want to keep anyone from the booze. Yes, sir. Uh, for students, how much time do you think we should spend, or, well, more to the point, how much money do you think we should spend <laughs> in any AWS credits on the cloud? Sure. So the question was, is, as a student, how much should I spend in AWS on the cloud? So first of all, I feel, especially having worked in education, that the accessibility of that stuff to students should be like a paramount thing, right? Like, I would feel if I was a staff at a, at a university and my students had to pay out of pocket to get computing resources, that I would like really think that sucks. Um, so, but there's, there's definitely tons of ways that you can use these tools without paying a lot of money, right? Like, like with us, if, you know, if you're committing open source code or whatever and you're helping the community, Nine times out of ten, we usually just, just like pay for your bill. Um, like if you're if you're doing cool stuff, right? Uh, AWS is like a developer program. Uh, Google has, of course, historically always been very supportive of open source developers. So if you're like involved with like a project doing something awesome, right? These companies recognize that value, right? They're like, there's a reason that like Amazon gives Debian developers AWS money. You know what I'm saying? Because um, fundamentally, those those companies kind of depend on the stuff that we eventually all build. Right, um, so I, I I wouldn't say like hey you only spend twenty five dollars you know a month I wouldn't say anything like that time wise obviously you know you should take care of your grades but the way I went through school is I spent way too much time because Quake had just come out and, <laughs> and remember remember Quake World when the networking happened that's when it got cool right like Quake by itself is really awesome and we did that already I did Doom I almost went to high school because of Doom right. Uh, but when Quake World happened, right, that network effect was really like the thing that made it, made it cool. So I, don't play video games, just like learn stuff. Like if, if I were to go back, I always think with my friends who are like, they, they, they teach at like community colleges and stuff on the side. It's like, man, we should make a new university where like your freshman year, you like, we teach you how to learn Git and then we don't teach you language, like, we force you to learn different languages every year. And like, we have all these crazy amazing dreams on how, how we should like foster the next generation of of developers, um, but no, I mean, it's, God, I don't want to sound like a, uh, like a sound bite, but when I went to school, you had to pay for a compiler, like you had to pay for a compiler, and it was not cheap, right, now we have two really awesome compilers, I'm going to say which one's the best one, um, right, it's really interesting, right, you can, you don't just have a kernel, you have like an entire mobile operating system that you can like mess with, right? Multiple ones, right? Whether that's Android or Ubuntu Touch or uh, Jola, whatever, Yala, thank you. Um, Firefox, or like, like multiple phone things, right? Um, so it's, it's just very interesting, like, before, like literally there is nothing stopping anybody from learning all these things other than like personal motivation. Whereas before it was like, I actually had to walk to a computer lab so I can get to a terminal to do stuff, right? And it was like, well, it's two in the morning. No one's going to be using the solar system. That, right? Yeah, I got to do my stuff, right? Um, now, now these days, you can do all this stuff from a phone. It's like crazy. So, you know, all you young people in the audience, like you have an amazing opportunity to shape the, of how our world operates. And I think that's really awesome. So I highly encourage you to be the next person that builds like Facebook or something. Just don't work for the app. Don't work for the NSA, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Am I? I used to work at a hospital, and I know that they are very resistant to putting anything in the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an inherent uh, ability to be secure, or is it just they haven't figured out how they're going to do it? Sure. So the question is, is uh, you work at a hospital, and they're very hesitant to put things in the public cloud in this case, right? Because when we say cloud, that can also be right. your internal systems. There are definitely a lot of risks there, right? Um, you don't control the hardware. You don't even control the hypervisor. Like there could be a dude at that cloud provider on the other end just looking at your proprietary stuff, right? Um, I don't really have like an answer for that other than if you really care about that sort of thing, you would run it on your own hardware, I think. Um, but the properties that make the public cloud so compelling, replicating those for yourself um, is what I would recommend there. I don't think anyone's ever gonna like build a totally secure Thing. There's always going to be risks, right? Um, the question is, like, am I in the same boat as everyone else? As long as it's not the Titanic, I'm okay. Right? <laughs> um, so, any other questions? Yes, sir. So, just on that, I think part of the 
part of the is not a security issue, but there are legal implications. Like when you move your data off of your stuff onto somebody else's, mm -hmm. you know, you've got like the third party law here in the United States and there's other yep. things in Canada. So like it may not even be a security thing. It may like be limited to like whatever contracts or lawyers have. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And how stuff with like HIPAA or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. No more. No one's gonna like make fun of me for Unity or anything. Or? <laughs> that, that was like my fault. Okay. Are you serious? That was your fault. I. <laughs> I I admit to showing Mark Shuttle with GNOME Do when I first started. It was one of the first things to do, like super key type, and then it gives you magically stuff. Um. But yeah, I I was kind of working on that stuff. It was it was really interesting. I forgot the lead developer's name. But the idea was to very super tight, get what you want. It's really awesome. And not everyone else stole it from us. Because everyone loves it, right? You love the Amazon lens. You look like the kind of guy who loves the Amazon lens. <laughs> That's really good. Yes, sir? Amazon Web Services. That's a good question. Someone actually asked what something stands for. So AWS stands for Amazon Web Services, uh, which is a whole suite of things. You'd be surprised what's in there. But it started off as just you got compute, which they call EC2. And you got storage, which was S3. Right, so if you think of the parts of your computer that you need to do stuff, this is something that they offer. So now you can get like Elastic MapReduce, you can, they have a transcode service now, I think, and like a lot of, when it started out, they call that infrastructure as a service, right, which is cloud infrastructure as a service. But over time, if they become more platform as a service, which is PaaS, right? I don't want to, oh God, too late. Um, so like, I've noticed that a lot of infrastructure as a, what we now call infrastructure as a service is very pas -y. Right? I mean, it provides a lot more things than just raw compute and things like that. The so, is free. yeah, yes. So when Azure first came out, it came out as a PaaS, and then they kind of retooled it to make it more infrastructure as a service. But there's a lot of great PaaSes out there. Actually, a lot of people remember the first time you saw how Heroku worked. Who's who's here? You use Heroku. You're like, oh, I don't have to care about the stuff on the back end. There's just Dino things, and they're all named after Max and stuff. It's like really cool. Um, but there are a lot of great PaaSes out there that you could use if you want to even abstract yourself even more. Things like um, OpenShift is pretty cool. There's like 50 billion Docker passes out there, um, and I haven't played with each one. I, I really need to do that. Um, so if you kind of want a more abstract thing that's a little bit more Heroku-like, and you want to look, look at a pass. Yes, sir? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, you can do you can do a lot of this stuff locally using things like Vagrant. There was a there was a session on Vagrant. Um, we use a lot of Linux containers at Canonical, LexC and LexD. Um, and obviously, like the whole point of Docker is to have that kind of this is what it would look like in the real life for your applications, right? Whereas LexD and LexC are more like lightweight VMs, lightweight VMs. Um, so you could definitely play a lot of that stuff on local hosts, like on your laptop. What I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to get like four or five banana pi or Raspberry Pi 2s and a switch, and then bam, 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 and then I'm going to deploy OpenStack on them and do all sorts of crazy things. Yes, that's a thing. Like, I think we've deployed, let's see, in real hard, because we have an OpenStack lab, we've deployed OpenStack, I think, 11,000 times this cycle. So I'm pretty sure it works if you try it. If you try it with the OpenStack. I hope it works for you. It will. I'm confident. I'm confident it will. Any other questions or comments? Anyone not understand the Star Trek jokes? Uh, that was kind of like a concern to me. See, I knew Linux people wouldn't let me down. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I'm around all day. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I hope you learned something, and please go forth, try this stuff, build the next something awesome, so I can retire. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, I, everyone.